Figure 1 shows a food chain in a pond. So here we have figure 1, the first is the algae, then a daphnia, a hydra and then a dragonfly nymph. Which term describes the daphnia in this food chain? Tick one box. In this chain, the algae is what's known as the producer because it's making its own food and using the energy of the sun. Then the first thing to eat the producer, which is the daphnia, and what we're being asked about is called the primary consumer because it's the first consumer in this chain. So the next one along would be the secondary consumer and so on. Draw a pyramid of biomass for the food chain. Label each trophic level. So we've got to draw a kind of diagram here and it's referring to biomass. So this is the biological material that is derived from living or recently living organisms. We also have this term trophic level. So a trophic level is a group of organisms within an ecosystem which occupy the same level on the food chain. So they're eating the same kind of thing and they're predated on by the same kind of thing. When you're drawing your pyramid of biomass, the number of tiers that you've got, so the number of different levels, is representative of the number of different organisms you've got in your chain. So in this instance, we've got the algae, the daphnia, the hydra, and the dragonfly nymph. And then the widths of your tiers you've also got to pay attention to. So the bottom tier is going to be the widest, and then your middle tiers will be in the middle, and your top tier will be the smallest. So your diagram should look something like the one on the right and you've also got to label each trophic level. On your lowest level with the most biomass will be the algae, then the daphne above that, the hydra above that and the dragonfly nymph at the very top. Give one reason why the total biomass of the daphne in the pond is different from the total biomass of the algae. So the reason for this is that not all of the biomass is absorbed by whatever's consuming and the mark scheme will allow you to go into some more specific details for this. So some of the algae that the daphnia is eating may be non-digestible, there may just be parts that the daphnia cannot use in its own processes and so that will be lost in the faeces or in the urea. And then it can also be used up in respiration so the daphnia needs to use some up as energy for itself. And then a last reason that you might go for is that not all of the algae is eaten. So the Daphnia may not have consumed 100% of all that biomass that it could be consuming. Students investigated the size of the population of Daphnia in the pond. This is the method used. Collect one decimeter cubed of pond water from near the edge of the pond. Pour water through a fine net. Count the number of Daphnia caught in the net and then repeat steps 1 to 3 four more times. Table 1 shows the results. So here we have table 1 and then on the left hand column there's the sample number, so 1 through 5, and on the right is the number of Daphnia in one decimeter cubed of water. Calculate the mean number of Daphnia in one meter cubed of pond water. 1 meter cubed equals 1000 decimeter cubed and then we've got the table 1 on the left hand side to help us out. Now remember to calculate the mean you've got to get the sum of the values and then you divide that by the number of values that you just added up. So here we're adding up the different numbers of daphnia in 1 decimeter cubed of water so 5 plus 21 plus 0 plus 16 and plus 28. And we're including the zero just because it reminds you that there are five readings and that should be included in your mean. So we divide that by five and the answer you get is 14. So this is our average number of Daphnia in one decimeter cubed of water. However, looking at the line at the bottom, it says the mean number of Daphnia in one meter cubed of pond water. So we've got to convert this value. And we've been given that one meter cubed is a thousand decimeter cubed. So what we've got to do is multiply our 14 by 1000. And the answer you get there is 14,000. So that's your final answer for this question. The pond was a rectangular shape 
measuring of length 2.5 metres, width 1.5 metres and depth 0.5 metres. Calculate the estimated number of daphnia in the pond. Use your answer for the mean number of daphnia in one metre cubed of water and give your answer in standard form. So this question is worth four marks. For this, we're going to need the answer from the previous question. So the mean number of daphnia in one metre cubed of pond water was 14,000. So we've got a note of that on the left. Now, volume is calculated by doing length multiplied by width multiplied by depth. So that's what we've got to do with the values the question gives us. 2.5 times 1.5 times 0.5 gives an answer of 1.875 metres cubed. So we know how many metres cubed we've got and we know how many daphnia are in one metre cubed. So the last step for this is to multiply the two together. So we do 1.875 multiplied by 14,000. And that gives you an answer of 26,250. So this is the answer as an ordinary number. However, it says to give it in standard form. So we've now got to convert this. Standard form is written as y times 10 to the power of x, with y being a number between 1 and 10. To convert, we write down 26,250. We make a decimal point after the first digit there so that we make it between 1 and 10. So this will be 2.6250. And then we've got to count the number of digits after that decimal place to see how many orders of 10 we're multiplying by. So in this instance, we've got 1, 2, 3 and 4 after the decimal point. Making this 2.625 times 10 to the power of 4. So that's the way you've got to write your answer. Now, for this four marker, you get the first mark for calculating the volume of the pond, the second mark for knowing to multiply that by your 14,000 calculated in the previous question, another for getting that calculation correct, and the last for your standard form. Rainfall can cause fertiliser to be washed from farmland into a pond. The students investigated the effect of fertiliser on the population of daphnia in water from the pond. The students put 20 daphnia in each of five different concentrations of the fertiliser. The students counted the total number of daphnia in each concentration of fertiliser after two weeks, and figure two shows the results. So here we have figure two, and the y-axis shows the total number of daphnia after two weeks, and then the x-axis is the concentration of fertiliser in milligrams per decimeter cubed. A concentration of 5.0 milligrams per decimeter cubed of fertiliser caused a large increase in the population of daphnia. Explain why. So what's happened here is the fertiliser has fertilised the algae and it's caused it to start growing really quickly and we've got lots of it in the pond. So this means that there's a surplus of food for the daphnia and they're able to eat plentifully. Figure one is repeated below. So here we have figure one and we've got the food chain from earlier, the algae, the daphnia, the hydra and the dragonfly nymph. And it says the population of hydra will decrease when 20 milligrams per decimeter cubed of fertilizer is added to the pond. Explain why. So if we have a look back at figure two, we can see that where there is 20 milligrams per decimeter cube in the last bar, the total number of daphnia after two weeks is very low, it's the lowest on the chart. Then we can have a look at our food chain. So the algae is what's feeding the daphnia and maintaining that population. The daphnia is then feeding the hydra and the hydra feeds the dragonfly nymph. And we know that at 20 milligrams per decimeter cubed of fertilizer, the population of Daphnia is very low. And this means that there's less food for the Hydra. And so that explains why the population is going to decrease. Genetic material is made of DNA. Which structures in the nucleus of a human cell contain DNA? And the answer to this is chromosomes. 
Figure three shows part of one strand of the DNA molecule. So here we have figure three. It's given us empty labels X, Z and Y, and then we've got this phosphate group, which is the little white circle. Label parts X, Y and Z on figure three. Choose answers from the box. If we have a look at figure three, the top label is label X, and this is pointing to the sugar. And a way that you can identify this is by noticing that the shape is a pentagon. And that tells us that it's a pento sugar, meaning it has five carbons. And in this instance, the pento sugar is deoxyribose. The next label down is label Z, and this is pointing out a base. In DNA, the bases are adenine, guanine, thymine and cytosine, and this is represented by the letters inside each of the boxes. The bottom label, label Y, is showing you a nucleotide, and this is the combination of the phosphate, the sugar and the base. So these are the monomers that make up your DNA structure. A complete DNA molecule is made of two strands twisted around each other. What scientific term describes this structure? And the answer here is a double helix. DNA codes for the production of proteins. A protein molecule is a long chain of amino acids. How many amino acids could be coded for by the piece of DNA shown in figure 3? Tick one box. So an amino acid is coded for by three bases. So what we need to do is figure out how many sets of three bases are given to us in figure three. We can see that there's nine altogether and that gives us three sets of three. So that's the answer that you need to tick. Scientists have now studied the whole human genome. Give two benefits of understanding the human genome. One benefit you might mention is the diagnosis of genetic disorders. Another is the treatment of disorders such as this, so these could be inherited disorders or genetic disorders. And you only need two reasons to get these marks, but just as some alternatives, you could give understanding the evolution and ancestry, or the ethnic origins of humans. And lastly, you could use it to trace human migration patterns over history. Phototropism is a growth response by part of a plant to light. Name one other tropism. Give the stimulus the plant responds to in the tropism you have named. The first answer you might go for here is geotropism, and this is stimulated by gravity. Another tropism that the monk skin will allow is hydrotropism, and that term hydro tells you that the stimulus is water. Another that you could say is thermotropism, and again the prefix thermo tells you that it's to do with temperature, and in this case it's heat. Plan an investigation to show the effect of light from one direction on the growth of plant seedlings. Include details of any controls needed. You may use some of the equipment shown in figure 4, and any other laboratory apparatus. And this question is worth six marks. So here we have figure four. We have a lamp, several pots of seedlings, some scissors, a ruler, and we have cardboard boxes with lids. Now remember that this is a six mark question. So just listing six relevant points is not necessarily enough to get you all of the marks. Your method must lead to a valid outcome and it must be sequenced in a logical order because you're effectively giving the instructions for this experiment. A way that you can start off with this is by describing the setup of your experiment and also naming the control variables, the things that you're going to keep the same so that there's nothing else affecting your experiment. So you can say to use several pots of seedlings that will be given the same amount of water and also be in the same temperature and soil type. So here the relevant points you're making are that you're naming control variables like the same amount of water and you're mentioning the equipment you're using, i.e. the several pots of seedlings. Now you want to set up your control part of the experiment. So we've got the same temperature and the same soil type. 
Now we want to have a pot that's got an even amount of sunlight on all area around it. So this is there for comparison against the other pots. And what we do with these other pots is we put them in our cardboard boxes. So these boxes will have their lids on the top and then they will have a hole cut out on a specific side. And what this does is control the angle from which the light can shine onto the plant. So now we're beginning to describe our dependent variable and this is the thing that we're going to measure throughout the experiment. So what we've got to do to be able to compare is measure the seedling height at the very beginning of the experiment before the light has been hitting them or they've had any time to grow in these conditions. So we calculate an average length for each pot by straightening the seedlings out against the ruler and then dividing by the number of seedlings we measured. Then you want to leave the seedlings for a sensible amount of time, so enough for them to grow a little bit, and you're going to measure again using the same method and calculating another average. The last stage of the experiment will involve calculating the difference between the heights of the seedlings before and the heights after, so this will be a mean increase. Now we're trying to measure the tropisms, and so what you can do is take a projector and measure the angle of bending of the plant, because if you've got a cardboard box that has a hole in a specific side, the plant is likely to bend towards it, and you can measure how close that angle of bending is to the direction of light entry, and see if there's a correlation. So this is how you get your mark for a valid outcome. Explain how phototropism in a plant shoot helps the plant to survive. This question is worth three marks. So in phototropism, the plant is inclining towards the stimulus, so the sunlight. So the plant leaves are receiving more light, which means that they can carry out photosynthesis at a greater rate. This allows it to then go on to make more glucose. And for that last mark, there are a couple of alternatives to glucose that the mark scheme will allow. Glucose is the monomer, however you can talk about the polymers, starch, carbohydrates and other organic materials. The human eye can focus on objects at different distances. Figure 5 shows how a clear image of a distant object is formed in a person's eye. So here we have figure 5 and we can see the light rays from this distant object being directed onto the back of the eye. Explain how the person's eye could adjust to form a clear image of a nearer object. And this question is worth six marks. So the first thing that needs to happen is the ciliary muscles will contract. So these muscles can be seen just on either side of the lens. And when they contract, they have a smaller diameter, a smaller cross section. And those string-like structures connecting the ciliary muscles to the lens, so these are called suspensory ligaments, these will start to loosen or slacken. What goes on as a result of this is the lens in the middle starts to thicken and it takes on a more rounded or convex type of shape. And this will make the lens more convergent. And the meaning of this word convergent is just that the lens is now bending the light or refracting it in a more inward direction. And your final mark is for saying that the image is therefore focused onto the retina, onto that position on the back of the eye where the brain can detect it. Explain why a long-sighted person has difficulty seeing near objects clearly. So there are two reasons for this that the mark scheme will allow you to give. One is that the eyeball is too short and the other is that the lens cannot be thickened enough. And either of these will give you the same result, which is that the light is focused behind the retina rather than on it, which is where the cone cells and rod cells will be able to detect it and send the image to the brain. The mark scheme will also allow you to describe this part of the lens not being able to be thickened enough. And the reasons for this are that the ciliary muscles are too weak or the lens does not have enough elasticity. Long-sightedness can be corrected by wearing spectacles. Describe how spectacle lenses can correct long-sightedness. And this question is worth three marks. 
So first of all, you want to state what specific lens is going to correct long sightedness, and this is a convex or converging lens. So there are two types of lenses. You have your convex lens, which is the type that's narrower at the top and at the bottom, and it is wider in the middle. The other type is the concave lens, which is wider at the top and bottom and narrower in the middle. And the difference is the convex lens will direct the light inwards more and the concave lens will direct it outwards more. And you have to state this in your answer. So you say that the convex or converging lens is used to refract light rays inwards more. Now your last mark is for saying how this helps. So this focuses the rays of light onto the back of the eye, onto the retina, where it can be detected as an image. Table 2 gives the classification of four plant species. So here we have table 2. On the far left hand column we have the group, so there's kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus and species. And then we have species 1 through 4 along the top row. And the question says, species 1 and species 3 are the most closely related. What information in table 2 gives evidence for this? So here's species 1 and species 3, and what we want to do is look for the similarities in that chain of kingdom, phylum, class, order, and so on. We want to see to what extent they're the same. So the top row is the same for all of them, they're all in the same kingdom. And then if we look at phylum, those are all the same as well. However, once we get to class, we can see that species 1 and species 3 are one thing, and species 2 and species 4 are another thing. So that's the first difference we spot there. Now we're looking to see if species 1 and 3 are more similar or if species 2 and 4 are more similar. So if we look at 1 and 3, they're the same order. If we look at 2 and 4, they are not the same order. And that's what tells us that species 1 and species 3 are more closely related. And the way you put that in words is by saying that they are the same kingdom, phylum, class and order as one another. Figure 6 shows the inheritance of flower colour in two species of plant. So here we have figure 6, on the left is the pea plants and on the right is the snapdragon plants. The top row is what's called the parental generation and then the offspring of that is the F1 generation. So the question says, in pea plants and in snapdragon plants, flower colour is controlled by one pair of alleles. In figure 6, the parental generation plants are homozygous for flower colour. In heterozygous pea plants, the allele for red flower colour is dominant. And in heterozygous snapdragon plants, the alleles for flower colour are both expressed. So there are a lot of key terms to think about here. The first one being alleles. So an allele is a version of a gene. The next one is that term homozygous, so this means that both of the alleles are the same. For example, they might both be the dominant allele. We also have this term heterozygous, so in this instance one allele would be dominant and the other one would be recessive. Remember, a dominant allele is the kind that will always be expressed if it is present, but if you've got two recessive alleles there is no dominant allele, so the recessive one will be expressed. Use the following symbols for alleles in your answers. So for pea plants, the capital R is the allele for red flowers. The lowercase r is the allele for white flowers. And we know from our earlier information that the red flower is the dominant allele and the white is the recessive. That's where the red flower has the capital R symbol. Then with our snapdragon plants, C with the capital R in the top right is the allele for red flowers and C with a capital W is the allele for white flowers. And these are capitals both in the top right because they are both expressed. What is the genotype of the red flowered pea plants in the F1 generation? So to answer this, you need to use the information that was given to you in the question. One of the things that we know is that both parents in figure six are homozygous. So both of them have two of the same allele. The diagram showed that one parent was red and the other one was white. So if we were going to represent this in a Punnett square, we would have one parent with two capital R's, so that would be the red parent, 
and we'd have another with two lowercase r's. Then when we put that all together, you end up with four offspring with one capital R allele, one red allele, and one lowercase white allele. So this is the F1 generation. They are all heterozygous, and that's going to be your answer, the capital R and the lowercase r. What is the genotype of a white flowered snapdragon plant? So you remember from the information given in the question, in the snapdragon plants, both of the alleles are expressed which means it's written as C with a capital W or C with a capital R. And because there is none of the red that's expressed, we know that both of them must be C with a capital W. So that's what you put for your answer. A gardener crossed two pink flowered snapdragon plants. Draw a Punnett square diagram to show why only some of the next generation plants had pink flowers. Identify the phenotypes of all of the offspring plants, and this question is worth three marks. Again, we have to use the information given to us in the question. So we've got two pink flowered snapdragon plants, and this means that they come from a homozygous red and a homozygous white parent. And that means that all of that generation, all of that pink generation, is going to be heterozygous C capital R, C capital W. We also have to understand the term phenotype. So the phenotype is the observable characteristic of the organism. So in this instance, we're talking about the colour. Now you have the information to start drawing your Punnett square diagram. So your parents are going to be the heterozygous, the C capital R, C capital W, and that's the case with both parents. And then you just fill in the boxes to get the offspring. So we have CR, 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 CW, CWCR and CWCW. Then the last thing you've got to do is identify the phenotypes of each of these offspring. So we have the CRCR offspring, that's going to be red because it's homozygous with the capital R. Then you have the CWCW, so that's homozygous white, so that's going to be totally white. And then the pink is all the ones that are heterozygous, so the ones with CWCR and you can see that one in four is the red, one in four is the white, and two in four, or a half, is the pink. And while to get your marks, you don't necessarily have to calculate the probabilities, it does help to show that they are not all going to be pink. So here you'd get a mark for identifying your parental genotype, you get a mark for identifying an offspring genotype, and then you get another mark for identifying the phenotype associated with it. What percentage of the offspring would you expect to have pink flowers? And we've got a copy of the Punnett square diagram we just drew to help us out. So the genotype that gives you pink flowers is the heterozygous, the one with a W and with an R. In total, the Punnett square shows four offspring. So we want to find the proportion of this four that have the heterozygous genotype. And we can see that there are two of the four. So two of four is a half. Half of the percentage is 50%, so that's your final answer. Commercially, hundreds of pink-flowered snapdragon plants can be produced from one pink-flowered plant. Figure 7 shows a tissue culture technique used for producing many plants from one plant. So this is figure 7, we have one pink flowered snapdragon plant at the top and then it's showing us the process so a leaf is removed and they scrape off several small groups of cells onto agar jelly. Then we have the diagram showing agar jelly plus nutrients plus hormones. It's kept in sterile conditions at 20 degrees celsius and then we can see that many saplings are produced. Give a reason for each of the following steps shown in figure 7, and this question is worth 5 marks altogether. So the first bit asks why several groups of cells are scraped off of the leaf. And notice the part in bold, so that's asking us specifically why several groups of cells are scraped off. And the reason for this is that more cells means that more saplings can be produced, because remember the goal of this process is to produce many plants from just one. The next bit asks why nutrients are added to the jelly. 
This provides materials so that the cells can make amino acids or proteins. The mark scheme will also allow you to give some descriptions of what these do, so you can just say it's for growth, or you could talk about how energy is needed. So these nutrients provide energy, and they can also be used for respiration. That's another thing that has to happen for the plants to grow. Why are hormones added to the agar jelly? This is so that roots and or shoots can develop. And when we say develop, this is talking about the differentiation of cells. Then it asks why the plant cells are kept in sterile conditions. The key word here being sterile. And the reason for this is that it prevents the entry or the growth of microorganisms. If they are allowed to contaminate it, then they could cause damage to your plant cells. They could cause disease or decay. The last one asks why the plant cells are kept at 20 degrees Celsius. So this temperature of 20 degrees is the optimum temperature for the plants to grow. And you can also talk about it being the optimum temperature for the enzymes to function. Explain why the method shown in figure 7 produces only pink flowered plants. So what the examiner wants you to say here is that all of these new plants that have been produced were produced by asexual reproduction. And by this, we mean that they were produced by mitosis with only one parent. As a result of this, all of the daughter plants are genetically identical to the pink flowered plant that they were produced from. So there are a few different ways that the mark scheme will allow you to say this. So by identical, you can say that all of the daughter plants are clones. You can talk about their genotype, so all are CRCW. And you could also say that all of them have the same genes or DNA. Water conservation is important to the human body. Which gland releases the hormone that controls water loss from the body? Tick one box. So having a look at the options, it's not the adrenal gland because we know that releases adrenaline, which isn't to do with water loss, it's to do with exercise and energy. It's not the pancreas either, that releases a lot of digestive enzymes. The pituitary gland, however, is an option because this releases ADH, which is to do with water loss from the body. And then the last one, just to show that that is incorrect, is a thyroid and that releases thyroxine, which is to do with metabolism. Which hormone helps the kidneys control water loss from the body? Tick one box. So the answer to this is ADH, that's the first option. And just to show why the others are incorrect, Adrenaline is again to do with exercise and energy. LH is to do with the menstrual and reproductive cycle. And thyroxine is to do with metabolism. A man is walking across a desert. The man has used up his supply of drinking water. Explain how the gland you named and the kidneys reduce water loss. And this question is worth three marks. So what the mark scheme wants you to say here is that there's a higher concentration of blood and the reason blood is more concentrated is because this man is losing water in the desert and there's less water now in his blood. And the result of this is more ADH is released from the pituitary gland and it will start to move through the bloodstream. What the ADH then does is increase the permeability of these tubules that are in the kidney and it means that water is more able to move through them and be reabsorbed. So the overall effect of this is that an increased amount of water is being reabsorbed back into the kidney. So here you'd get a mark for talking about the events leading to the release of more ADH. You get another mark for talking about the increased permeability of the kidney tubules, and the last is talking about the reabsorption. Some people have kidney failure. Doctors may treat patients with kidney failure by either dialysis or a kidney transplant. Explain two biological reasons why most doctors think that a kidney transplant is a better method of treatment than dialysis. Do not refer to cost or convenience. And this question is worth four marks, so that's two marks per reason. So what you can say with reason one is that when you have a biological kidney, 
as opposed to a dialysis machine, the changes in concentrations or levels of substances or urea in the blood are minimised. And this means that there's less chance of damage being caused to the tissues or cells of the body. And when we're talking about these changes potentially causing damage to the cells, we're specifically talking about osmotic stress and also poisoning from urea. For reason two, you can talk about the blood not being in contact with the dialysis machine because this is an external device and it will increase the chance of that blood becoming infected. Alternatively, you could talk about another symptom of using dialysis, which is the fact that the blood is more likely to clot. So if you've got a biological kidney, you don't need to take anti-clotting medication. Ragwort is a weed that grows on farmland. Ragwort is poisonous to horses. Plan an investigation to estimate the size of a population of ragwort growing in a rectangular field on a farm, and this question is worth four marks. To get four marks on this question, your method must lead to a valid outcome, and you also must list your steps in a logical sequence. Firstly, you want to start to explain your method of counting. So in this instance, you want to use a metre by metre quadrat and a quadrat is just a square frame that can be thrown out onto the field. Next, you have to show how you're going to avoid bias. You can't just place the quadrat in any place because you might have a tendency to place it somewhere where there's more or less weed. So you've got to place them according to a random set of computer generated coordinates. Another way you could ensure random placement is by having the person throwing it close their eyes. To get enough data that you can do some valid calculations with it, you want to throw or place the quadrat at least 10 times around this field. And then when you place it, count how many plants are within the quadrat each time. When you add all of these together and divide by the number of quadrats you've used, so maybe 10, you can then calculate the mean population of ragwort per quadrat or meter squared. You then need to calculate the total area of this rectangular field and use it to estimate the total number of ragwort in this field. So the population of ragwort in the field will be the mean number of plants per meter squared, so the mean number of plants per quadrat, multiplied by the area of the field in total. So your last bullet point there is how you get that mark for the valid outcome and each red tick in this is a relevant point that you could include your answer. You don't necessarily need every single one, so long as you're getting to your valid outcome and it's in a logical sequence. The herbicide glyphosate will kill ragwort and other weeds. Scientists use bacteria for the genetic engineering of crop plants to make the crops resistant to glyphosate. Figure 8 shows the growth of a culture of the bacteria in a solution of nutrients at 25 degrees Celsius. So here's figure 8. On the y-axis we have the number of bacterial cells in millions per centimetre cubed and the x-axis shows time in hours. Why did the rate of reproduction increase between 2 hours and 7 hours? So the reason for this rate of reproduction increase is because there was more bacteria at this time and this means that more divisions or reproductions of the bacteria could happen per unit time. After 12 hours, the rate of reproduction decreased. Suggest three ways the scientists could maintain a high rate of reproduction in the bacterial culture. And this question's worth three marks, so one mark per reason. So there are quite a few potential answers here. You could add more sugar, that would be an energy source. You could add more amino acids or proteins, so these are good for growth. Or you could add more oxygen for respiration. And these are the only ones that you need to get three marks, you only need three reasons. However, there are some alternatives you could say. So you could increase the temperature. You can also continually remove the waste or any toxins that are in with the bacteria. You can ensure a constant pH and you can also occasionally stir the culture. The rate of reproduction of the bacteria is fastest at 7 hours. 
How many times faster is the rate of reproduction at 7 hours than the rate of reproduction at 12 hours? And this question is worth 4 marks. So to answer this question, you have to find the rate at 7 hours and the rate at 12 hours. And to do this, you've got to use figure 8. In order to find the rate at a particular time on a curve, you must draw a tangent to that point on the curve, which effectively gives you an instantaneous gradient. To find the value of this gradient, you have to do the change in y divided by the change in x. So you might start by finding which point on the x-axis is your 12 hours, and then finding the corresponding point on the curve. Then you draw a tangent from that curve, so a tangent is a straight line just touching that point. Next, start to find the gradient of this. So you want to pick points that are quite easy to read off of the graph. So the one that's circled is exactly crossing a particular place, and the y value is 115. You also want to choose points that are quite far away from each other on that tangent. This takes into account more of that line and will make your answer more accurate. So the second point has a y value of 60. So to find your change in y, it will be 115 minus 60. Now we can look at the x values. So that higher up circle has an x value of 20 and the lower down circle has an x value of 4. So this works out as 55 over 16, which will give you a final answer of 3.437 and so on. Now you can repeat the process to find the rate at 7 hours. So draw the point which is at 7 hours on the x-axis, draw a tangent from that point, and find some suitable places on the line to get values for x and for y. So the y values here are 75 and 25. These then have corresponding x values of 10 and 5. So this works out to be 50 divided by 5, which gives an answer of 10.0. So, returning to the original question, how many times faster is the rate of reproduction at 7 hours than the rate at 12 hours? So we know that the rate at 12 hours is 3.4, the rate at 7 hours was 10.0. So what we do is divide that 10, that 7 hours rate, by the rate at 12 hours, the 3.4. So after you've calculated this, you get an answer of 2.9411 and so on. So this is approximately 2.9. Now for this particular question, the examiner knows that not everyone is going to get the exact same answer. So the first mark is just for correctly drawing a tangent, and the next two are for getting a rate for 12 hours and a rate for 7 hours within a certain range. Because there is a range for both of these rates, it means that there's going to be a range in your final answers. To account for this, the mark scheme allows a final answer between 2.9 and 3.4. Scientists transferred a gene for resistance to the herbicide glyphosate into the bacteria. The genetically modified bacteria can then transfer the glyphosate resistance gene to a crop plant. Explain the advantage of making crop plants resistant to glyphosate. And this question is worth three marks. So the advantage of this is that making the crop plants resistant will cause the glyphosate to kill the weeds, but not the crops themselves. The effect of this is that the competition for the plants is eliminated, so the plants now don't have to compete with the weeds to get enough light, water or nutrients. They will therefore grow more successfully and the farmers will have a higher yield of crops. And that's all you need to say to get the three marks, talking about killing the weeds but not the crop, less competition and a higher yield. It is important to keep the blood glucose concentration within narrow limits. A person eats a meal containing a lot of carbohydrate. This causes an increase in the person's blood glucose concentration. Explain how the hormones insulin and glucagon control the person's blood glucose concentration after the meal. And this question is worth five marks. So the questions told us that the person has consumed a lot of carbohydrate and carbohydrates are broken down into glucose monomers, which causes the blood glucose in the body to increase 
and the response to this is the release of more insulin. What that insulin then does is cause the cells of the body to take in glucose from the bloodstream. It lowers the blood glucose levels. You can then go on to point out that insulin causes the glucose to be converted into glycogen. So glycogen in animals is a storage molecule. The result of all of this is the blood glucose levels will decrease. And if they decrease past a certain point, the body will then correct that by secreting glucagon. Glucagon then causes the glycogen, that storage molecule, to be broken back down into glucose to increase those blood glucose levels again. The body cells of a person with type 2 diabetes do not respond to insulin. A person with type 2 diabetes often has a higher blood insulin concentration than a non-diabetic person. Explain why. And this question is worth three marks. So the cells aren't responding to insulin and this means that they are absorbing less glucose. And if the cells aren't absorbing this glucose, it means that it is remaining in the blood. So the glucose concentration in the bloodstream remains high. These very high levels of glucose are detected and this stimulates the pancreas to release even more insulin to try and bring that blood glucose level down. So overall, this is one mark for saying that less glucose is absorbed, another for saying the concentration remains high, and another for saying that the pancreas releases more insulin. Metformin is a drug used for treating people who have type 2 diabetes. Scientists investigated the effects of metformin and two other drugs, A and B. The scientists wanted to see how the drugs affected the blood glucose concentrations of 220 people with type 2 diabetes. This is the method used. Put the 220 people into five groups. Treat each group with a different drug or combination of drugs for several weeks. Give each person a meal high in carbohydrate. And measure the blood glucose concentration of each person 30 minutes after the meal and again 3 hours after the meal. And you're asked to suggest three variables that the scientists should have controlled in the investigation. So you get three marks for these variables. And remember, the control variable is the thing that you keep the same throughout the experiment. So examples of this could be age, height and mass. So that's their relative size. And also the proportion of males to females in each group, because sometimes there's a difference between the results that they might get. Alternative controlled variables could be the severity of the diabetes that the patients have, the dose of the drug that they get, they also might control the starting blood glucose concentrations, and finally any other existing health conditions that the patients may have, because these can also have effect on how quickly their blood glucose concentrations will change. The scientists recorded their results as a mean value for each group. The scientists calculated the standard deviation for each group's result. Standard deviation is a measure of the spread of the individual's results above or below the mean value. The scientists gave each group's result as a mean plus minus standard deviation. The larger the standard deviation, the greater is the spread of the results around the mean. The question asks which of the results is the most precise? Tick one box. First of all, make sure you understand your definition of precision. So how precise a set of values are is how close they are together. So a precise set of values might have quite a small range and the standard deviation will also be very small. So all you have to do for this question is look at the standard deviations and see which is the smallest. So that is the value of 15.4, the second box down. Table 3 and figure 9 show the scientists' results. So below we have table 3 and it gives us the drugs used along the top row and then we've got the number of people and then we've got the mean blood glucose concentration 30 minutes after the meal in milligrams per 100 centimetres cubed plus minus the standard deviation. And here we have figure 9, so it is a graph and it's got the mean percentage reduction in blood glucose concentration 3 hours after the meal. 
So the first one was for 30 minutes, this is for three hours afterwards. And on the x-axis we have the drugs used, so each bar is a different drug or a different combination of drugs. We also have these eye-shaped symbols which you can see at the top of each bar and also in the key. So these represent the standard deviations. In table 3 and figure 9, some standard deviations of results overlap. An overlap of standard deviations shows the difference between the means is not significant. No overlap of standard deviations shows a significant difference between the means, so the results are considered to be different values. A student looked at the scientist's results in table 3 and figure 9. The student stated, metformin works better when used with other drugs. Evaluate the student's statement. Okay, so here the question has given a lot of information, so it helps to break it down into steps. The first thing that it gives us is that an overlap of standard deviations shows the difference between the means is not significant. So what this means is if the results for one variable and another overlap in their ranges, then they are considered to be not different in the results that they give. So a really good example is that between metformin and drug A by itself. The error bar representing the standard deviation of the results of drug A completely encompasses that of metformin. So a lot of the time the results produced by these two drugs is the same. And you can see that it's the same case for drug B. The error bar is completely encompassed by both that for A and that for metformin. There's lots of overlap and there is no significant difference in the results. But if you look at the error bar for drug B and then you look at the error bar for metformin plus drug A, you can see there is no overlap at all. So you know that the results of B and the results of metformin plus A are completely different. They're considered to be significantly different. By drawing along the error bar for metformin plus B and the error bar for B, you can also see that there is no overlap here. So B and metformin plus B also have significantly different results. By a similar process, you can also determine if the results in table 3 are significantly different. And you do this by calculating the upper bound and the lower bound values for each drug. Using the first one as an example, to find the upper bound value, we have to add the standard deviation to the mean. So 177.2 plus 15.4 will give us our upper bound value. To find our lower bound value, we take away the standard deviation from the mean. So in this case, our upper bound is 192.6 and the lower bound is 161.8. And now we repeat that process to find the upper bound and the lower bound for all of the following drugs and combinations. Remembering to add the standard deviation to the mean for the upper bound and take away the standard deviation to get the lower bound. And now we're looking for numerical overlap to see if there are significant differences or not. We can look back at the question here to make sure that our workings are relevant. So it says the student stated metformin works better when used with other drugs. And we're evaluating the student's statement for six marks. So essentially, we're looking to see if there is a significant difference between metformin acting on its own and metformin plus A or metformin plus B. The first thing you want to do to get full marks on this question is make a judgement and you have to link that judgement to evidence that is given to you by the question, which essentially means use the graph. You need to ensure that you're quoting the data that is given to you and draw from multiple areas or multiple values to make sure that your judgement is properly supported. So we can start on our reasons supporting the statement or evidence that the student is correct. So metformin is in the first bar on the bar chart in figure 9. And we want to know if the performance of metformin alone is significantly different from the performance of metformin with A or B. So let's look at metformin plus A. If we follow along the top of the metformin error bar and the bottom of the metformin plus A error bar, we can clearly see that there is no overlap and metformin plus A is significantly different in its results. It's significantly more effective in reducing the blood glucose concentration three hours after the meal. And that is how you want to word it in your final answer. So we say metformin, or we can shorten it to met, plus A 
gives a significantly greater reduction in blood glucose concentration compared with metformin alone. And make sure you get in that comparison word. And you can add that clarification that this supports what the student is saying. Now let's compare metformin alone with metformin plus drug B. So again, we're going to draw along those error bars and see if there is any overlap to indicate significant difference or none. And as it turns out, the bottom of the metformin plus B error bar does overlap with the top of the metformin alone error bar. So we can say that there is not a significant difference here. However, we can still recognise that the mean results for metformin plus B is quite a bit higher than that for metformin alone. So in our answer, we state that MET plus B gives a greater average reduction in the blood glucose than MET alone. Then we can move on to compare the significant differences, because we know that from our first statement, MET plus A does give a significant difference. This is an opportunity to show the examiner that you do understand what you're talking about and you understand the meaning of the standard deviation. So you state that MET plus A standard deviation does not overlap with met standard deviation. And this means that there is a significant difference in these results. However, we also know that the metformin plus B standard deviation does have overlap with the metformin standard deviation. And this means that there is not a significant difference on this part. And this can be put down as evidence against the student's statement. Now we can have another look at table three. And the first thing that we could talk about is the group sizes. We notice that these groups are not very large, which essentially means that not very many repeats have been done because each person is like a repeat. And the other thing that we can say is that the groups are all of different sizes. This can be added to our evidence against the student statement because it's evidence that the experiment itself may be producing results that are not actually representative of the entire population. Or you could state here that the experiment may not be repeatable or reproducible, meaning that using the same method or a different method designed to produce similar results may not give you those similar results in practice. The last thing the mark scheme allows on experimental technique is that the question doesn't give you any information about control variables that are used in this experiment, such as the drug concentrations or the health of the group. And this means that the results produced by this experiment may not be valid. We don't know for certain if these results are due to the drugs or if they could be due to something else. So now we have sufficient evidence for either side of our argument and we can make that final conclusion. So we can say conclusively, MET works on average better when used with other drugs based on the results that we have. In this respect, we are agreeing with the student, but we're saying that it is not exclusive, it is on average. We then go on to say that, however, the data may not be reliable enough to draw this conclusion, and we may need to do further experiments to validate this. Overall, you're getting marks for talking about MET plus A and then MET plus B and comparing it with just MET on its own. And then you talk about the standard deviations and if there is overlap and what that means in terms of significant differences. And then the last couple of marks are on experimental technique and having your conclusion.